Okay, so welcome to this third video on uh, NMDA receptors. Okay, so what we've discussed is these unusual, uh, this unusual uh, voltage current graph here. Okay, uh, so what does this mean physiologically? It means that if you try and open NMDA receptors when the cell membrane is too depolarized, uh, sorry, too, hy too hyperpolarized, i.e. the electrical potential difference across this membrane is too negative, i.e. maybe minus 65 millivolts, then no, they, they, they will have no effect, basically. They will not um, conduct uh, much current at all because very quickly magnesium will go into the pore and will basically sit in the pore and act as an open channel blocker, basically. Okay, and that'll stop all current going through these NMDA receptors. So, NMDA receptors are only important and will only actually conduct um, positive charge when you are substantially depolarized, basically. Okay, so that's the important physiological uh, me message of uh, this graph. Right, so now what I want to discuss is the insensitization of the de or the desensitization of these uh, NMDA receptors. Because what we saw in the uh, videos on AMPA receptors is that basically if I plot time on uh, this um, x axis here and I plot um, current moving from the intracellular to the extracellular. Um, at, from the intracellular to the extracellular compartment. Okay, so when we what we saw is that when we activate AMPA receptors, so if I just um, remind you of an AMPA receptor, so let's say this is an AMPA receptor here, when we activate AMPA receptors by binding four glutamate molecules to each one of those subunits, then that opens, and that opens at minus 65 millivolts, usually. It doesn't have this silly magnesium problem that NMDA does have. Um, so, in, this opens at minus 65 millivolts, and uh, at that electrical potential, what's going to happen is that you're going to get positive charge moving from the extracellular space to the intracellular compartment, basically. Okay, uh, so mainly sodium is going to move into the cell, and that's going to cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So if we're plotting current moving from the intracellular to the extracellular space, well, we've got a current moving from the extracellular to the intracellular space, so that counts as a negative current moving in the opposite direction, basically. So what you see is basically something that looks like this. So current going into the cell goes up very, very quickly, basically. Uh, but then very quickly, it also drops back off, and then you have no current. And this is, isn't because the glutamate has fallen off. The glutamate is still bound. Uh, you've still got all four glutamate molecules in these ligand binding domains of each of these uh, subunits of the AMPA receptor. Uh, what has happened is that the receptor has gone back into uh, its closed um, its closed conformation, even though the glutamate has, um, is still bound. And that phenomenon is known as insensitization. So insensitization to glutamate. Now, the NMDA receptor does show a similar phenomenon, but it's much, much slower. So, okay, if we now look at what this graph looks like for the NMDA receptor. Okay, so let's say we have activated these NMDA receptors. Glutamate has bound to the NMDA receptors. Two glutamate molecules are bound to each of these non-GluN1 uh, subunits. And two uh, D-serine or glycine molecules have bound to these GluN1 subunits here. Okay, so the gluta-NDNA receptor has opened. Now let's say that we're at an electrical potential where we don't need to worry about magnesium or uh, we're at... Um, we have, we're doing experimental science, so we have removed all the magnesium from the outside of the cell. In fact, that's probably a better, better way of doing it. Let's say we are working at minus 65 millivolts, but we have removed all the magnesium, so we've got rid of this stupid effect now, and that means that the um, voltage current graph will look more normal, basically. It'll be this straight line, rather than like this. So once you remove all the magnesium, you get rid of this effect. Okay, so what you then observe is, again, you'll get a current moving into the cell uh, in the form mainly of sodium. However, the NMDA receptor has a lower conductance for sodium. So, the, well, sorry, it's got a lower conductance full stop. 
So the current, the maximum current is much, uh, much lower than the maximum current for uh, the AMPA receptor. So you have a, a peak at a lower, um, a lower current level coming into the cell. But then desensitization is extremely slow compared to the desensitization of the AMPA receptor. So this is the NMDA receptor. Okay. So insensitization create, uh, takes much, much longer for the NMDA receptor than it does for AMPA. Right. And overall, the amount of current that uh, the NMDA receptor allows in in this entire period is much more than the amount of current that the AMPA receptor overall allows in. Okay. Right. Now, that's pretty much all I want to say about the NMDA receptor at the moment. We will come back and study more of its properties and involvements physiologically. But now what I want to say is a bit about um, some pharmacological uh, tools that you can use to interact with it. So one of the things that you can use is you can use magnesium ions to block NMDA receptors. If you up the concentration of magnesium, you're obviously going to up the block of uh, these NMDA receptors. So that's one of the ways in which you can target NMDA receptors. Okay, another uh, target is obviously the molecule itself, the N-methyl diaspartate. This is a, um, a uh, competitive agonist. Well, you don't usually say competitive, but it is an agonist for these NMDA receptors. It will bind and uh, it will, uh, it will um, cause a change in the conformation of the NMDA receptor to um, shift it into its open state, basically. And it binds to the same binding domain as glutamate, okay? So it binds to the same binding domain as glutamate because aspartate has a very similar structure to glutamate. So just to remind you, uh, this is, uh, th if this is the general structure of the amino acid, so here's the carboxyl group, here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen, then you have the aspartate group here. And basically, the difference between it and glutamate is that a glutamate has a free carbon carboxylic acid group sticking off here, whereas aspartate only has a two carbon uh, carboxylic acid group. Okay, so off this um, amino group, uh, you then have, sorry, not another amino group, you have a methyl group, so N-methyl diaspartate. And again, the D refers to the type of enantiomer it is, so it's another dextrorotatory enantiomer. Okay, so one of those ones where corn is red anti-clockwise. Uh, right, so this molecule is going to bind where glutamate binds uh, to the uh, NMDA receptor. And so two of them are going to bind, one to each of these uh, non-gluN1 subunits. And that is going to cause the receptor to open, providing that you also have D-serine or glycine uh, molecules bound to these, each one of these gluN1 uh, subunits here. And usually, it's not the glycine or the D-serine that is important. Usually, you have enough glycine and D-serine in the extracellular um, compartment that um, these are always occupied, these sites. So it's the glutamate that is the key molecule that causes uh, the opening of this receptor. Um, so I'll repeat that uh, because it's worth repeating. Glycine, and D you usually have a high enough extracellular concentration of glycine that these sites will always be at, uh, will always have glycine bound to them. Therefore, when you release glutamate, the NMDA receptors will be activated. Similarly, uh, this uh, molecule, n methyl diaspartate, it will bind there, and the glycine sites will always already be activated, basically. Uh, so it will cause... Um, an agonistic effect of this receptor, it will cause it to open. Okay, so now another another molecule is called AP5, uh, which stands for 5-phosphono, um, so 5-phosphono, whoops, wait, actually, sorry, no, 2-amino, I think it's 2-amino, you put that first, then 5-phosphono valeric acid, 5-phosphono valeric acid. Okay, so I'll show you the structure of this molecule now. So AP5, it's denoted that for 2-amino-5-phosphonovaleric um, acid. So the P5 obviously denotes the 5-phosphono, and then the A must stand for aminovaleric acid or something. 
Okay, so what is the structure of valeric acid? Valeric acid is just the old name uh, for the five carbon uh, carboxylic acid, basically. So um, pentanoic acid. So here we go. Here is a, a five carbon carboxylic acid, and valeric acid just means uh, basically you have a carboxylic acid group on this first carbon, and then all the others have hydrogens bonded to them. Obviously, we have got a bigger molecule than just valeric acid, but that's what valeric acid would be. You just bond hydrogens to all of these carbons to saturate it, basically. Now, because we're talking about 2-amino 5-phosphonovaleric acid, we're also going to want an amino group on the second carbon. So the way in which you label the carbons is the carboxyl carbon is labeled carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5. So 2-amino, we have our amino group here. 5-phosphono, so we'll stick on a phosphono group. And this is the structure of a phosphono group. You bind the carbon to phosphorus, and then that's bonded to a hydrogen. Uh, a carbon, well, a double bonded to oxygen up there, and two hydroxyl groups. So that's the phosphono group there. So I'll circle that. This is our phosphono group there. Okay. And uh, this two amino here refers to this. And then everything else is just the valeric acid. So we just stick a few hydrogens in. And that is basically the molecule of, um, of AP5. Now, what does this molecule do? Well, basically, it binds to the same site that glutamate would bind on the NMDA receptor, and it is a competitive antagonist for that site. So it's a competitive antagonist for glutamate. So it binds to the site where glutamate will bind on these non-glu uh, N1 uh, subunits. So it will bind here and here. And basically, it does not activate those subunits. It does not make uh, the NMDA receptor open. All it does is it blocks the glutamate from being able to bind to those sites, and therefore it blocks glutamate being able to activate the NMDA receptor. So it doesn't inhibit the receptor, but it inhibits the activation of the receptor. So overall, down-regulates the activity of these NMDA, NMDA receptors by stopping glutamate from being able to activate them, or at least reducing the amount by which glutamate can activate them. Okay, so that's AP5. Now, two other important drugs are ketamine and fencyclidine. So, both of these are anesthetics, and um, fencyclidine is no longer used, and it is now used as a recreational drug under, it's got the name angel dust. So, if you ever hear that, that's what this means. Um, and fencyclidine is often also abbreviated to PCP. Uh, not, to be uh, not to be confused with pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, so um, these two drugs interact with NMDA receptors, and they basically do the same thing as magnesium. They are open channel blockers. So if we have an NMDA receptor here, when glutamate and glycine bind to the NMDA receptor, it will cause the NMDA receptor to open. And basically, these drugs can go into the pore of the NMDA receptor, and they will block it. So ketamine and fencyclidine go into the pore of this uh, NMDA receptor when it is open. So when glutamate and has bound to these two sites here, and as I say, you will usually have glycine bound constituent constitutively, so glycine or D-serine, but glycine is the main one. D-serine. Okay, so glycine and D-serine are usually constitutively bound to both of these um, ligand binding sites of these glu N1 subunits. But when glutamate, two glutamate molecules come and uh, fill each of these uh, ligand binding sites on these two non glu N1 uh, subunits, then the receptor will be activated and it will adopt an open conformation and it will allow uh, a current to move through it. Ketamine and fencyclidine go into this channel and they block it. They get stuck and they block it. And that is how they stop NMDA current. So they're both non-competitive antagonists for NMDA receptors. 
because they don't bind to where glutamate binds, they actually are open channel blockers, non-competitive antagonists. A more better description, I don't like that phrase, non-competitive antagonists, because they're actually inhibitors. Antagonist, an antagonist suggests that it's just binding and stopping activation, whereas these are actually blockers. So I think a better name for them is open channel blockers, because that tells you exactly what they are. Okay, uh, and these drugs have an effect uh, known as produce, they, they produce what's known as a dissociative anesthesia, which basically, um, it, they make you feel as though you are sort of dissociated from your sensory organs, so as though your sensations are very, very distant and far away, and they distort uh, your uh, perception of sight and your perception of sound, and they produce hallucinations, so fencyclidine is a very strong hallucinogenic. Ketamine is still actually used as a general anesthetic and occasionally as an analgesic. Uh, fencyclidine is not used clinically. It used to be used as an anesthetic uh, clinically, uh, but as I say, it is used recreationally. And if you ever hear anyone referring to angel dust or PCP, that's what they mean, fencyclidine. And it's going to inhibit your NMDA receptors by uh, blocking the open channel.